everybody, welcome to Missing Mara Mari. This is Tim. Before we roll today's episode, we wanted to preface it by saying that some of this information is inaccurate. Just before uploading this episode, we noticed an update James Renner posted to his article on Alden Olson and Vester Lee Flanagan. It turns out the commenter wasn't actually Vester Lee Flanagan. We spent some time talking about it in this episode, and we wanted to leave it in because we still found it interesting, and just know that this is a great example of how this case can get convoluted. Please follow us on Twitter at MauraMurrayDoc, and give us a good review on iTunes if you feel like it. It does help. Thank you very much, and we hope you enjoy the show. Maura Murray was born on May 4, 1982, in Hanson, Massachusetts. By the age of 21, she was 5'7 and 120 pounds. On February 9, 2004, in Haverhill, New Hampshire, Maura Murray crashed her car on Route 112. There has never been a confirmed sighting of Maura since that night. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Maura Murray, please contact the New Hampshire State Police. This is the Missing Maura Murray Podcast. Welcome back to the show, Lance. Um, today we are going to have author James Renner back on for a, uh, a great conversation, mostly about some of his blog posts recently. Yeah, so his blog posts have kind of uh, uh, sparked a, a lot of interest, uh, probably in the last uh, week or so, I think. So uh, we'll have him back on. We'll chat with him about those. Yeah, he's got one that we want to go over, five clues that make no sense about this case, uh, among other blog posts that he has written recently. Um, I know we mentioned James A. Conrad on a previous episode. We're going to get into him. Also, Alden Howes Olson a little bit and the man who killed Allison Parker and Adam Ward, Vester Lee Flanagan. And could there be a link between Vester Lee Flanagan and Alden Olson? And if it's not a direct link, James is going to talk about the possibility of Vester Lee Flanagan being influenced by Alden Howes Olson. Welcome back to the show, true crime author James Renner. How's it going? Great, great. Thanks for having me on again. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, I, I'm, I'm expecting many more uh, trolls to comment about uh, uh, very minute bits of information that I put out there this time. Um, that's always fun to parse through for a couple of weeks. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you guys have, have found on your own as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of people really focused on that uh, sociopath comment from uh, from a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, we were trying to def defend your comments, um, but do you want to add anything to to that? Eh, you guys don't have to defend um, <laughs> <laughs> my comments. Feel free to throw me under the bus. Uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, um, I, I get into it a little bit more in the book, of course. Um, you know, but uh, you know, I think if you look at um, her actions and uh, motivations up to the point of the disappearance, I, you know, that I stick by it. You know, I think, I think this uh, this woman, this young woman, was uh, extremely smart, um, and I, I, through no fault of her own, um, and mostly through her upbringing, had uh, learned the means of survival, uh, even if it was to the detriment of of everybody else. So yeah, she was a sociopath. Of course she was. On the video that Alden Olson uh, posted, the happy anniversary video with him cackling uh, that he released on the anniversary of Mara's disappearance, there is a comment from Vester Lee Flanagan. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so... So what we're getting into now is this weird um, echo chamber where, because of the success of your guys' podcast, 
a lot more there there's so many more people that are that are coming into the fold here so many more people being introduced to Morris case this is generating much more attention um, to my blog and so people are, are once again coming to me with tips and information that I didn't have um, and one of the people and and now here we are again talking about it right it's a it's a never-ending cycle and it's getting bigger and bigger uh, which is good you know this case needs attention um, and we're seeing it working. Um, one person reached out to me uh, via email uh, a few days ago and said, hey, you got to look at your YouTube page. Um, this is the Alden Olson video that you mentioned where he's taunting the family. Now, what's, what's interesting is, uh, I don't know if you guys remember how, how all this went down, but uh, you know, we're talking four years ago or so now, three or four years ago, um, where he put this up on the anniversary. Now, uh, I was talking to Lance at the time, and uh, Alden Olson uh, tried to uh, take that, and I, I figured he would try to do this. He he eventually tried to delete any evidence that he had put that up there, along with the video. Now, Lance was able to download that um, and send to me, and then I put it back up on YouTube, and that's where it's at. So um, it's a record you know, it's a, a, of history here. Um, as a journalist, that's part of what we do. Um, we make sure that uh, you know people that are suggesting that they murdered Maura Murray can't just disappear back into the woodwork. Um, let's look at who this guy was, and eventually we discovered it was this this man Alden Olson. Um, now, then you have Vester Lee Flanagan, um, who uh, made a comment that's one of the top-rated comments on Alden Olson's video. And of course, now we know Vester Lee Flanagan as the man who. Uh, murdered two journalists in cold blood on live TV last week. It, it was no surprise to me that Vester Lee Flanagan had commented on Alden's video. Uh, this is the type of thing that Alden has hinted that he would do for many years. Um, and, he, you know, he's been taunting me and my family, um, you know, since his video has gone up on my YouTube account. Now, Vester Lee Flanagan, we now know, is, is the man who... Um, murdered two journalists in cold blood on live TV last week. Um, you know, he uh, had this top-rated comment, and when he shot the journalist, he filmed it, um, I, I believe on his phone, and then uploaded the video to uh, both Facebook and Twitter um, and went out to social media. Now, um, you know, that is certainly the type of thing that we know um, Alden uh, you know, loves to do. He loves to upload these things and taunt the family, taunt the investigators, and make social media part of the conversation in a way that Vester Lee Flanagan took to, um, and, you know, he, he certainly raised the bar. So this was a year ago, right? It says one year ago? Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. So the comparison can be made that he possibly got the, the, the idea to, to manipulate social media like this from the Alden video? Is that what you're saying? I, I believe so, yeah. Uh, I mean, you look at what, what Vester did, and you got to ask, where did he get this idea? Well, yeah. we know he was very familiar with Alden Olson's videos. Wow. Yeah, yeah. and I just want to point out um, that Alden had uh, – it's it's basically what you wrote in, the, in your blog post here about um, you're making attempts to see what can be done to, to prevent Alden from threatening you and your family. What kind of reaction have you been getting from, from law enforcement? Well, when Alden Olson posted a YouTube video uh, that was nothing but pictures of my, uh, at the time, six-year-old son, um, I went to prosecutors uh, in Massachusetts. Um, Steve Gagney is the DA out there. And uh, I started sending him these threats as they were coming into from Alden. Alden will do um, things that he thinks are not quite crossing the boundaries of direct threats to my life and to my family's life, although though I do believe he's overstepped those boundaries with the video of my son. And he'll do stupid stuff like send me pictures of um, my face on uh, you know the, the body of Kenny from South Park. Um, where we all know what that's saying, you know, Kenny's the one that dies in, in every episode. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, when I take that to a prosecutor, he's like, what's this, this is a cartoon, you know, this doesn't say anything to me. 
And it's like you you got to look at it, um, you know, uh, completely. Um, and the things that he's done over the last few years, I mean, he's uh, been in direct contact with, um, you know, I, I was, uh, uh, I taught um, English composition at the University of Akron. He's um, directly threatened me through, uh, you know, contacting my employers there. Um, I mean, it was, it's a mess. This guy's stalking me. And Wait, so I took he, all that. Go ahead. Uh, he's, he's contacted your, your former or your current employers. Uh, what does he do? He, he calls them? Yeah, uh, emails them. Emails, emails. Yeah, yeah. As um, as Alden Olson. Yeah, huh. yeah. He'll sign it, Alden Olson. You know, he'll say. What does he uh, write? Um, you know, it it, it it just about like the weirdest, um, oddly threatening. You know, hi, I'm I'm Alden Olson. I'm this, uh, you know, this this gentle old man from Hadley, Massachusetts. I just like you to know that your professor James Renner. And I'm not a professor, but you know, I'll take the title at least. Um, you know, uh, is is obsessed with this true crime of of this young girl who went missing in Massachusetts. And is that really the type of person you want representing your school? And look at the way he's gone after you know Fred Murray and these other people, and really just trying to insinuate himself into my life. And uh, so he took all this information to Steve Gagney, the DA. And uh, I presented it to him, and eventually it led to this phone call between uh, the DA, myself, and uh, the I believe it was the sheriff or the chief of police out there. And uh, we had this phone conversation about whether or not they were going to charge Alden Olson. And during the conversation, I learned that Alden Olson had also been contacting them, um, trying to get them to charge me um, with uh, you know defaming him, you know, by putting his name up on there. And, oh, and also. Um, by uh, the comments on his creepy video, right? So I, we 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 were able to take his video and keep it so that he couldn't delete it and put it up on YouTube for history, right? So there are commenters on there that are like, "This guy's creepy," you know. This, you know, he's certainly killed Maura Murray. Let's go get him, you know. But you know, it's all talk on on there. So he took that as as threats and and uh, convoluted it so that. You know, he was trying to get the DA to come after me, and uh, it was just nuts. You know, I'm on this conversation, and I'm like, well, guys, you know, what about this YouTube video of, of my six-year-old son? That's clearly a threat. Um, and uh, and they said, well, first of all, we can't find the YouTube video because he deleted it. We weren't able to get it in time. So, you know, but they, they, they have the power to, to go to that service and to full, to pull the records. And, you know, that's still sitting on a server somewhere, but they didn't want to find it. Um, and, uh, you know, so um, and I said, what about this video of my son? And, and uh, the chief of police or whoever this was on the phone kind of laughed and said, well, you know, he got those pictures from your Facebook profile. He's like, it's kind of your fault for having your kids' photos on your Facebook profile. And that, well, to me, is like the weirdest backwards way of looking at this thing. Total victim blaming. Like, uh, it, it boils down to the the old, well, you deserved it because of what you're wearing, you know, argument. So, um, it's it's just a complete mess. And and then you know, I try to put this aside, and then something like Bester Lee Flanagan happens, where this guy clearly seems to be inspired by Alden Olson, um, and Alden Olson is threatening to, you know. Um, all along do something like Bester Lee Flanagan has done and I can't get anybody to do anything about it so I have to wait here until Alden Olsen comes knocking on my door jeez um yeah it makes me wonder if if Alden had any contact with Vester um I I just want to read the comment that he wrote to Vester Lee Flanagan it's because it's pretty weird he wrote you idiots why are you disliking this? He is posting this for you guys to see. He isn't the guy in the video. Yeah, he's defending me, right? Because it's um, from your YouTube account. Yeah. Yeah, people were disliking it because, you know, at they first thought you created it. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so that's, Vester Lee Flanagan is, is kind of doing that. But the, the important part in, in my mind is that Vester was very, very much clearly aware of Alden Olson and the type of stuff he's done. And what he did when he shot this journalist is is do what Alden would have done, which is film it and put it up there for the world to see. He even wrote a, uh, one of these rambling manifestos that that he sent after the the crime to different um, news newspapers and and uh, t- 
TV stations. And, um, you know, that's the same thing Alden's done before. He's got these manifestos that he'll put up online or, or send out. And, um, you know, it's frightening. You know, it really is. This is, um, you know, uh, directly um, threatening me, my family, my, my career, you know, it's, um, and uh, the DA is just sitting there. So have you spoken to anybody in law enforcement with this connection yet? Uh, no, no. Um, yeah. I, I did, uh, I did send it along. I'm sure the DA is aware of it, you know, um, I don't know. Um, you know, another thing that I, I, you know, the reason why I'm, I'm trying to get them to take another look at Alden Olson recently is, is I was finally able to pull the public records related to when, um, Alden, uh, got in trouble a few years back for threatening to murder members of his own family. Um, and you know, the DA and Alden himself has, have always made Alden Olson out to be this harmless guy. But you look at these police reports and his family, who knows him better than anybody, is clearly afraid of this man. Um, you know, he was, uh, you know, they, at one point he had an altercation involving a shotgun. Um, luckily nobody was murdered, but they took away his gun for a little while. Um, I just learned that he was able to get his gun back. Um, so... This isn't, uh, you know, everybody is like, well, this is a harmless old guy. Uh, his family sure doesn't think so. So Alden's got a gun, at least one gun. At least one gun, yeah. I just yeah. want to be clear. We're not suggesting that Alden did anything to Mora. What is his connection to the case? Well, he suggests that he's done things to Mora with, you know, by putting the, the little ski ticket up there. Hey, I was, you know, 20 minutes away from the crime scene a day after it happened. I mean, there's no other conclusion you can draw that. Alden Olson wants us to believe that he, um, you know, harmed Mora. So I believe that was the first video that he posted, correct? He posted the ski ticket video, which was um, simply uh, a Brenton Woods cross-country ski pass that had that Ken Burns type effect on it where it's slowly zooming in to the date. And the date was two days after Mora went missing, uh, 2004. So I, I believe it was February 11th, 2004. That's what the, um, that's what it zoomed into. That was the first video, correct? I think that's right. Yeah. The second video was the, the laughing, the happy anniversary video, but wasn't it brought to light later on that the date was photoshopped? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I honestly was not aware of of that no it what is do you believe it was photoshopped it was on something that alden blogged about he said that he did the uh the photoshop i don't know you know i i don't put anything past this guy but you know a, again here we are giving him more attention you know is that uh, is that the right thing to do or are we just documenting the historical record it's a it's a it's a funky gray area do you think he actually has any knowledge of what happened to mora is there any way that he does he really does i don't think so um, I think he's just a guy that, you know, you see this in a lot of true crime cases, and I've investigated, you know, several. Uh, there's always that person that wants to insinuate themselves into the narrative and the storyline. Um, I remember the Amy Mihalovic case, uh, which was the subject of my first book. There were a few detectives that had worked on the case that uh, 10 years after this girl was abducted and murdered were in a church for service. And this guy stands up in the middle of service and says, I have something to confess. Fast, I killed Amy Mihalovic. And uh, all these detectives <laughs> happened to be there, and they jumped on this guy and tackled him. He's just some nut, you know, just some nut that wanted attention. Had nothing to do with the crime. But this will happen a lot. You know, detectives deal with this. This is why they, you know, they when some guy comes in and wants to give a confession, they, they really have to take a look at whoever it is to make sure that they, in fact, could have committed the crime. You know, look at the guy that came forward with John Benet Ramsey. Um, a few years ago, you know, so you know, that's that's all I think this is. And so, speaking of people sort of uh, taking to social media, uh, last week we had a a guy named James A. Conrad take to Facebook, and uh, this guy is a former member of the New Hampshire State Police, and he took to Facebook on the Mora Murray Missing Facebook group, which is run by Helena Dwyer Murray a member of Mora's family. And he said that um, that the New Hampshire State Police know who did this or have a very good idea of, of who murdered Mora. And it sounded like that 
they um, weren't going to prosecute because they didn't think they could get a conviction. Yeah, again, this is, you know, this is some some of the new information that's come out thanks to you guys. You know, obviously this this guy has was motivated to get back into the the Maura Murray pages and 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 blogs and Facebook profiles uh, because of your podcast because of the attention it's getting. So, here's one of those people that came out of the woodwork. Um this James A Conrad uh was a uh, uh, a trooper um and he he, you know, just like you said, posted on uh, this official Facebook page that uh, he had inside knowledge of the case and that the police knew who did it, um, that Mora was buried under a house, um, you know, not too far from the uh, the crime scene. But like everything in this case, you look a little deeper and things get a little weird. And that's what happened with James Conrad. You go back and, and look into his history, you start to get a sense that maybe there's a motive for him coming out and saying these things. Conrad was a, uh, a state trooper until 2007. Um, at the time he was separating from his wife, um, he gave an emotional resignation at his barracks after being accused of entering his ex-wife's home. Uh, during that confrontation, uh, he threatened to pull another trooper's gun uh, in, an, in what appeared to be an attempt uh, of uh, suicide, uh, what, what is known by death by cop. Um, this uh, led to Conrad being arrested and um, detained. Uh, he ended up um, actually suing the, 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 the troopers involved for wrongful imprisonment. Um, he was awarded $1.5 million judgment in 2008 over this whole thing. Of course, he lost his job. He has not been a trooper um, since then. Um, and uh, I, I've learned that that $1.5 million judgment was vacated after that. So, you know, does this guy have an axe to grind with state troopers? Um, is he just dealing with old information? Did they really believe that Mora was buried under some house back in 2004, only to, you know, after 2007, when Conrad was long gone, come to the conclusion that, that she ran away? Um, you know, how much of what this guy says is, is truth or or was true at the time, it's, it's, it's hard to say, but, you know, on the page, um, when he came out with this information last week, he purported that this is, you know, he's like, uh, you know, this is 100% true. And, you know, I, you have to ask yourself, is it? And why is he coming out now? Yeah, that, that's the question that Lance and I had is that, you know, so if he does have an axe to grind, the question is, why would he come out now? And why talk about this case in particular? There's a bunch of cases he could have uh, talked about to besmirch the police if that's really what he wanted to do. And putting his face out there, his name out there, and we've actually uh, tried to contact him. And um, has he gotten that? Uh, no, he actually deleted uh, one of our requests. How did he delete? We sent him a request on Facebook, and uh, oh, and okay. it was deleted. It wasn't read. It was just deleted. But we may have his phone number, so I think we're gonna we're gonna try him sometime soon. Yeah, I, I mean, let's, let's. I'd certainly be interested in hearing what this, you know, further what this guy has to say. I think it's pretty clear who he suspected uh, in Moore's disappearance. Um, you know, but again, I'm I'm thoroughly convinced that what we're dealing with here is not an abduction and murder. You know, that's clearly the way he's looking at it. And um, yeah, I know there were some police that you know thought the same way he did early on. Uh, you know, you have to remember, you know, one of the things that came out in my reporting is the fact that there were four lie detector tests given uh, by detectives um, to suspects in the case, mean, suspect meaning suspects in Moore's murder, if that, in fact, is, is what, what this is. And that, that's, you know, so of those four lie detector tests, two of them um, were the bus driver, uh, Butch Atwood. He took two lie detector tests. Um, one, he reportedly failed. Um, and asked to take it again. He's, he had all sorts of medical conditions, uh, bad heart, uh, bad kidneys. And, you know, the, he died, you know, just a year or two later after, the, after these tests. Um, the second one, um, according to his uh, common law wife, um, was uh, inconclusive. Now, the third test was, I believe, um, a guy named uh, Claude Moulton. Um, who we may have mentioned before, there was this, Fred had said that um, some guy in New Hampshire came up to him with a knife and said, my brother killed Mora, and this is the knife he used. And they sent that knife to get tested, and that brother eventually had to come in. 
So, um, but there's this fourth test that has never been accounted for, um, and I don't know who who took that and whether or not it's this suspect that Conrad is talking about here. Um, but yeah, they've they've had a number of suspects that they've they've looked at for. Uh, murder in this case. I just want to read a couple of his comments, uh, if you don't mind, real quick, just uh, to give a little basis for the audience. He said in a thread, I have retired and no longer work for the state police. So that is a question that should be asked of them. Uh, more specifically, Russ Conte, he was the unit commander. He says, you have to realize that prosecutors don't like to take chances and would rather let someone go free before losing a case in court. He says all that matters is their conviction rate. He later goes on to say, I suspect that Mora is buried under the suspect's new house. Why the state police hasn't obtained a warrant to excavate that area, I don't know. They have probable cause based on statements made by the suspect himself. So the people of New Hampshire should demand answers. Yeah, I mean, he's a trooper. He knows it doesn't work that way. You know, so that, that to me says there's, you know, the motivation here is bad blood. Um, you know, he's obviously pointing the finger here at Rick Forcier, um, who I don't know if you guys have really gotten into talking about. No, we, we've only mentioned him in a uh, passing way where uh, we've given his account of uh, what he said happened when, you know, he saw or thought he saw uh, someone who looked like her running across the street on his way home from work. Rick Forcier lived across the street from Butch Atwood on the corner there of uh, 112 and um, I think Bradley Hill Road mm -hmm. is what it was. He's a neat character. He's this uh, kind of old surfer dude um, slash contractor who does and slash guitarist um, who has these videos on YouTube where he plays some kind of goofy, you know, almost Jimmy Buffett like original songs. Um, and I spent a lot of time out there, you know, like you guys have, and and one of the people I, I was asking around about was this Rick Forcier because, you know, he may be the last person who saw Mora that night. Uh, he claims that he saw her jogging down 112 when he was coming home from work, if that's true. Um, so uh, I learned a lot about him. Everybody down there likes Rick Forcier. You know, he's this neat, you know, kind of charismatic guy. You know, but he came forward with a story months after I think Moore disappeared, and the police were wondering why it took him so long to come forward. And my take on that is, uh, you know, he he's just this kind of storyteller, you know, who likes to tell tall tales. And I think he got to talking one night and remembered the time he saw somebody jogging down 112 near the time that Moore went missing and put two and two together and thought, oh, you know what, uh, it would make a better story if that was Mora. And I think that's how it happened. I don't think it was Mora. I think Forcier is just this guy that likes to tell stories. Um, he built a house. Uh, at the time that Mora disappeared, he was living at a, in a trailer on his property, and he was building this house. And that's clearly the house that uh, James Conrad is, is talking about. Um, you know, under the foundation is where he, he claims, uh, you know, the, the body was. Um, but you know, I certainly don't look at force here as a suspect, but then again, I don't. I don't think Moore has uh, has been abducted and murdered. Have you talked to uh, Rick Force here? No, I've talked to you know people that were close to him, family members, and you know friends, uh, but he won't talk to me directly. He's since moved. Uh, he no longer lives on that corner. When he moved, um, the police uh, swept in and. Uh, uh, pulled his trailer over. It was being hauled by somebody that wasn't Rick. Um, and they did a quick search of his trailer because Forcier would never let the police on his property. That might sound suspicious, but when you get into the mindset of people up in that part of New Hampshire, it's kind of mind your own business type of thing. And, and uh, certainly if he thought there was even a chance they would look at him as a suspect, um, you know, I can imagine why he wouldn't have wanted detectives on his property. So, uh, but they didn't find anything uh, in the trailer. You know, otherwise he'd be he'd be arrested by now. So there's a uh, detail of the case that um, has kind of been grossly uh, um, misinterpreted, and that's the phone call that Mora's boyfriend Billy Roush uh, received. And uh, a lot of people think that it was Mora kind of sobbing on the other end and then it gets disconnected. Uh, could you shed a little bit of light on uh, the, the actual truth of what that phone call was? 
Uh, yes. So, you know, again, there's so many new people that are coming into this case now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting hundreds of comments on the blog as, as people start delving into this mystery. And yes, this is a very frustrating clue here because it's not really a clue. Um, this, this this phone call that Billy got uh, that uh, he reported at one time saying it just sounded like whimpering, like somebody lost in the cold. Um, and everybody believes this was Mora calling him a day after she uh, disappeared. Um, it was not Mora. Uh, the police have known this um, from a few days after Billy reported this call. Um, uh, Lieutenant uh, Scarinza, who was in charge of the investigation, tracked down a woman at the Red Cross, spoke to her directly, um, and it was it was the Red Cross calling Billy. They were um, when somebody in the military needs to get leave for a, for an emergency like this. The Red Cross agents act as liaisons uh, between the, um, the the person and uh, the the bureaucracy of the military. And, and that's who this was. It was a worker with the Red Cross trying to get to Billy. Um, she didn't want to leave a message because this is sensitive material. Um, and, you know, she wanted to speak to Billy directly about what was going on. So um, she called back, you know, after that to speak to him directly. Um, and then, you know, didn't put two and two together that, you know, that that's what Billy was saying was, was the whimpering call. Um, it was, there was no whimpering. It was just somebody, you know, that you can interpret sounds a, as you want, you know, as they're just holding the phone before they hang up, um, you know, breathing as, as one would. So that's all it is. Uh, there's, it was not Mora. Um, the, the police have known this from very early on. Okay, good. Thank you for clearing yeah, that great. up. So that is not one of the, uh, five clues that make no sense about this case. Um, that is, <laughs> we know what that one is. Um, but you wrote yeah. a, a blog post recently that, that I really liked. Uh, it's, and it's called five clues that make no sense about this case. And it really, I think it hit them all right on the head. Maybe we can start with number five, Kate's faulty memory. Yeah. We were talking about her last time. So, uh, uh, she was more, more his friend, Kate Markopoulos. There was this party, right? That, that, that occurred, um, the weekend before Maura disappeared. Um, that was supposedly at the dorm room of um, Sarah Alfieri. Uh, Kate Markopoulos, um, Maura's uh, best friend at UMass, was there too. Um, you know, when I reached out to Kate, uh, you know, this was just a couple years ago, she said that uh, the room for the party was packed. There was standing room only. Um, but she couldn't remember the name of a single other person who was there. Uh, even the guy that walked her out, she, um, a guy walked her and more out of the building, she said. Um, and then she lost track of Mora. Um, and this guy walked her, walked Kate back to, I think either her place or her car or something. And I said, well, you know, who else was there? And she said, oh, I don't remember. It was so long ago. But when I spoke to detectives, they, they have been frustrated with Kate Markopoulos from, from day one. Um, she's not been helpful. Uh, even back then, we're talking less than a week after this party occurred, she said she couldn't remember anybody from that party. Um, and she said something weird to me once. Um, it was an email where she said, uh, um, I know you'd really like the names of people that were at that party. It's just not going to happen. Um, I, I don't remember, and I couldn't help them then. And uh, furthermore, I didn't see many of them ever again. Or something along that line, and it was a weird like slip up because it like, well, which ones, who from that party did you see again, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Kate has a faulty memory that's that's very, very uh, well. She says it's a faulty memory, but you know she couldn't remember anything even a couple days after it happened. You have to ask yourself why, you know, why can't why doesn't she want to? share the names of anybody else at that party who could verify that this party took place, that Mora was there, that could talk about what happened at that party. I think something important happened at that party. Um, you know, whether it was uh, Mora talking about her plans of, of what was going to happen in the next couple days or whether something bad happened to Mora at that party. Um, but whatever it is, Kate doesn't want us to know. Yep, yep. Actually, we got a... Uh, we got a um someone commenting on uh, the podcast and uh, telling us that, you know, that they're enjoying it, but they find that some of the things that we're talking about 
uh, end up being a bit repetitive. And I think, uh, I think it's important. I think it's intentional that you need to keep, especially these five clues that make no sense. I, I think it's important to keep putting them out there because these are things that are uh, so close to what happened. If somebody's going to, if we're going to solve this case, you know, we can look to these, these questions, uh, the, these things that we do repeat again and again. Because I think if we had the answer to one of these things, it would really shine some light on to, on to what happened to it. It could be the key to solving it. Yeah, yeah and, I, and it's important for, for at least myself to keep reminding myself what the facts are. And not, yeah. not, uh, not getting kind of bogged down with, uh, with, with all the comments that go on top of, you know, on, on top of all of these uh, clues. The next one is uh, one of my personal fa favorites, the, uh, the family apathy. Do you want to fill us in a, a little yeah. bit on that? Yes. In the history, in the history of missing women, when have you ever met a father who doesn't want a book written about the case, who doesn't want the national exposure that a book would bring? And people will say, well, of course, Fred doesn't want a book written. Look at the way you've 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 treated him. Look at the look at the suspicion that you've cast on him. That is uh, revisionist history, because before I did anything on this case, I went to before I even had a theory as to what happened to Mora. I appealed to Fred Murray and asked him um, asked for his blessing for this book and told him I was going to be writing this book, and he got back to me through Helena. Um, and made it very clear that he didn't want any book written about this case, that he was done with it. Um, and that, to me, that's a, even from, from back then, that, that, was, that was the first red flag for me, for Fred Murray. Why does this what, guy not want somebody to look into it? What year was that? I, I think we're talking like 2010 or, or, or maybe early 2000. No, it was 2010. It was 2010. So we're talking five years ago, and <clears throat> before I, before I interviewed anybody, I went to Fred right. first. When did yeah, you start ahead. the blog? I started the blog in uh, 2011. There wasn't anything of, of yours online at that point. No, no, um, uh, I didn't start the blog until six or nine months after this 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 happened. You know, so there was nothing. You know, it was it was it was a journalist going to Fred and saying, "I'd like to write a book about your daughter's disappearance because I want to find out what happened." And he said, "No." He said it through Helena Dwyer Murray. Yeah, and I tried to contact Fred directly, uh, not just through Helena, but by leaving messages at his home um, and through email. And he 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 would never respond to me directly. And I'm a little confused who Helena Dwyer Murray is. We've we've been talking about her on the podcast, <laughs> and we keep we keep saying she's somehow related through marriage. She's not. Well, she's related. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. She's related through through marriage. She's related through. I believe it's a a cousin of Fred's through through marriage. And that gets back to the idea of family apathy, right? Like, why is this person who's three times removed from Moore's immediate family running? all the social media for it. Why is she running the website? Why is she running Facebook? Why isn't it one of Maura's brothers and sisters? Why isn't it her father? Um, you know, why didn't her mother join in the searches? Um, why didn't, why was Giulioni up there once? Um, why, why was Kate not so involved? There's this weird apathy from the family when it comes to searching for Maura and, and from getting involved in it. And, uh, you know, they've completely fallen off the radar. This, this is a family that is not typical. They are not acting like a family who um, is searching for Maura Murray. We've got some comments lately, some questions about Maura's mother. And you say here that, that she was never involved in the search for her daughter. Maura's mother's name was Lori. Uh, and she uh, eventually, a couple years after Maura disappeared, she died from uh, cancer um, on Maura's birthday, by the way. But uh, she was she was healthy. Um, in some ways, uh, you know, as, as best you can be, um, when uh, Moore disappeared, and she would never, she would never go up there to to join in the search. At this point, it would be, you know, that the the S word speculation. But yeah, why? Why would she not go up there? Because when I'm looking into the case, I I guess I made the assumption that she was probably too sick to go up there when I learned that she had cancer. It was not that. 
It was not that progressed. I don't know that she even knew she had cancer at that time. All I know is that the relationship between her and Mora was pretty strained. Um, you know, the, the relationship was not good between Mora and her mother. It wasn't good between Mora's mother and Julie either. Um, it was a very difficult relationship. Mora was kind of in charge of the house when she was still living in um, Hanson. Um, and she would kind of go and buy groceries and, and help her little brother out. Um, and so there was there's not a lot, a lot of um, uh, love loss there. Uh, but that said, you know, when Lori lost her daughter, when Maura disappeared, you know, any any instinct as a parent would kick in and you set that aside and you go find your kid. Um, you know, the only reason to me that you, you wouldn't is that you believe that she was OK, that she she was running away and that she was doing her own thing. You know, certainly if you thought there was a chance that she was abducted and murdered, um, you would get up there. Let's think of the media that the family has agreed to do. There was the Chronicle episode, the Disappeared mm -hmm. episode, and the Boston Magazine article, right? And then they came out when uh, Alden had his happy anniversary video, right? Yeah. Was there also Mari uh, Povich? No, no, no. It was uh, Montel Williams. Montel Williams. Right. Fred will do media that he can control. You know, one of the stipulations he has, and I've talked to a number of the producers and reporters who have worked with him directly, um, is that he will tell you what questions they can ask and what questions he will answer. And he will he, he says right up front, I will not answer any questions about what ha happened to Mora before the disappearance. Um, we will not talk about that. Um, we will talk about this and this and this, and that's fine. Um, and he knew that, I, you know, that's not the way I work. The last line of the family apathy clue uh, kind of gave me the chills when I first read it. Uh, her brother, Kurt, wrote a song he posted on his Facebook page about Mora, asking her what the family did to her to make her run away. I have two sisters, and I can't even imagine something like that. I can't even imagine members of my family doing something to make one of my sisters run away. So I think that's what gave me the chills when I read this, that he feels so strongly about this. He wrote, he wrote a song and posted it on his Facebook page. If one of your sisters disappeared in the White Mountains, would your first response be to write a song about why she ran away? Or would you just or would you believe that she was abducted and, and murdered? Um, you know, certainly if you thought that possibility existed that that she that she had been abducted and murdered, the last thing you would do is write a song about her running away. That's why I firmly believe that, that from day one, the family um, amongst themselves has always thought that, that this is a runaway, that Mora was, was getting away. That, uh, and, and I think that she was running away from her family. If you want to jump real quick, there, you know, a couple other parts in this, um, you know, five clues that make no sense. Uh, we've talked about this before, of course, but the London Dairy Ping, um, it, you know, the this came out in an affidavit um, signed by the detective in the case, Todd Landry, uh, where they uh, they were trying to get records uh, from cell phone towers, and uh, they believe that somebody called Mora from. Um, southeastern New Hampshire shortly before her disappearance, um, on the day of her disappearance. So as Mora was traveling into New Hampshire, it appears that somebody called her cell phone from New Hampshire. Do we know how long that phone call is or was? Um, no. I, I mean, the, the police may, may know by now, um, but it seems as though they, they didn't know who owned the number that was calling Mora at that time. Okay, so Londonderry, which is in the southeastern part of New Hampshire, um, it's, a right, it's pretty much right in between Manchester and Nashua, New Hampshire. The most direct route from Londonderry to Haverhill, New Hampshire, where the accident was, is Route 93 North. Um, it's about two hours or two and a half hours away from Haverhill, New Hampshire. It's 106 miles from town to town. 
you can go up 93 directly or you can cut over to 89 and travel in a northwesterly direction and that'll connect you to 91 north to Haverhill, New Hampshire. Now 91 is the um, route that we're all assuming Mora was taking when she left Amherst because it's right next to Amherst, Massachusetts. Now if you pass by Haverhill, if you're coming from Londonderry and you're traveling north on 93 and you continue straight, if you don't take Route 118 towards Haverhill, you can continue up 93 to Lincoln, New Hampshire, which is a popular tourist attraction uh, in the middle of the White Mountain uh, National Forest. And uh, you can continue up to Franconia, New Hampshire, which is another popular tourist attraction. Littleton, New Hampshire is a nice little town. Uh, these are all like within the White Mountain National Forest. Um, so there are, there's destinations beyond Haverhill, New Hampshire that you can get to if you follow 93 up that are, uh, that are touristy, that are, um, you know, there are, there's, there's inns there, there's skiing, there's a lot of attractions up in, up in, uh, up in that region. If you're driving up um, past Londonderry on Route 93, the road that you would take to connect to Haverhill is 112, the road in which Maura Murray had the accident. They're looking for the ping from the phone that called Mora's cell phone. So they, they know whoever whoever called her was near that London dairy. So I've always wondered if somebody so Moore is driving up ninety one and whoever's calling her, I believe, was driving up ninety three. This is great. Because I always I always read this as her phone had to be in this in the area of this of the uh, cell phone tower as well. I never no. even I got so hung up on her, why she would be going up 93, that it didn't even occur to me that she's driving up 91 and she gets a call from somebody driving up 93. Right, right. Doesn't it make, I mean, now it makes sense. Now it looks logical um, why she was on 112, whoever was you know making how, this call. I, you know how many times like I've talked about this with people and, and never <laughs> even thought of that? It's these little details that, you know, once you, uh, once you can kind of step away and, and look at them in a fresh way, suddenly they make sense. Londonderry is still two, two hours and 20 minutes away from Haverhill. So I wonder what, what time that call came through. Is it two and a half hours before the crash by any chance? I think it was pretty darn close, actually. You, the The document is um, on my blog. I'd have to pull it up. You'll have to see. But uh, I, I believe that's around the time frame we're talking about. So that could definitely have been someone uh, potentially going to meet her and just passing through Londonderry on Highway 93, and they could have come from Boston uh, or anywhere in eastern Massachusetts. Or yeah. You know, or I, I always wondered if it wasn't somebody that was bringing Mora uh, her passport and some odds and ends from home. So we've also got, you know, number two on this list of clues that don't make any sense is uh, definitely something we've talked about before with the rag and the tailpipe. And there's been a lot of discussion about that in the last week. Uh, it still doesn't make sense in my mind. The only thing that makes sense is that you'd want you want the car to stall. Um, and, you know, you got to ask who put it there. Um, and there's only one person who's um, suggested a, a reason for that rag being there, and that's Fred Murray. Um, and then, of course, you've got the this four thousand um, dollars that Fred Murray makes a big point about, um, and you know that's what we talked about last time, where you know he's got this weird amount of cash, four thousand dollars on him that he says he pulled from several different ATMs. And that story just, you know, doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that he would he would stop at ten different ATMs on his way um, to UMass Amherst. Um, it, you know, b because this was a weekend and not he you know he couldn't have just gone to the bank to withdraw it. So he withdrew it in a hurry um, by going to ten different ATMs. It sounds or several. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah. It's very curious. It is, yeah, just like a lot of things in this case. Yeah, and the $4,000 has never been accounted for. Fred's never answered the question as to where it went. No, I, I've i never been near him enough to ask that question. Uh, and, you know, he won't talk to me directly, and I, I don't think anybody's put that question to him, except perhaps the detectives. I really hope that Fred listens to this podcast. I mean, you you think that he reads the your blog, right, or had read it at some point? I, I think, 
if he doesn't, somebody else does and keeps him up to speed on what's going on for sure. A lot of these questions that we have about Fred can be very easily explained by talking to him. If anyone is, uh, if anyone's feeding him the information or if he's listening on his own, I would just love to just have an explanation and we can move on. Yeah, that, that goes for Fred Murray. I think uh, that goes for James Conrad. That goes for Alden Olson. If, uh, if any of you are listening, please contact us. We would love to have you on the show and ask you some questions. Keep up the good work and, uh, and good luck. And, uh, you know, hopefully this shakes, shakes something loose eventually. You know, a lot more people are, are tuning in, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, James Renner, for appearing on the show again. And um, please buy his book. It's called True Crime Addict, How I Lost Myself in the Mysterious Disappearance of Maura Murray. It is on Amazon now, but it won't be out until May 2016. And uh, love the cover. It's really great. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. And um, thank you, James, for uh, clearing up some things that I had uh, previously convinced myself were facts in this case. <laughs> yeah, you bet. No problem. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>